There are some good reasons to believe that Nietzsche was interested in Eastern philosophy during his lifetime. In the Antichrist, he states, Buddhism, I repeat, is a hundred times more austere, more honest, more objective. It no longer has to justify its pains, its susceptibility to suffering. By interpreting these things in terms of sin, it simply says, as it simply thinks, I suffer. Buddhism as a pessimistic and decadent religion for Nietzsche resembles Christianity, but it seems that he had far more admiration for Buddhism. He inherited most of his understanding of Buddhism from Schopenhauer, who considered his own pessimistic philosophy a European relative of Buddhism. Schopenhauer, in his research into Indian philosophy, appears to have attained the most comprehensive understanding among 19th century German thinkers of a system of ancient thought. Although Nietzsche did read about Buddhism, it was usually second-hand and westernized. He was predisposed to react to Buddhism in terms of his close reading of Schopenhauer. Many Buddhists have since disputed Schopenhauer's comprehension of their religion. Influenced by Schopenhauer, Nietzsche criticized both Christianity and Buddhism as forms of nihilism, where the will to non-entity prevails over the will to life. However, he soon feared the rise of pessimism in Europe would culminate in the triumph of the weary and passive nihilism. It is important to know that Nietzsche was not a nihilist, as some suggest, stating that the modern man would have to create his own values through a revaluation of all values, leading to the Übermensch, affirming the world and saying yes to existence, the pinnacle of self-overcoming. The foundation of his critique of Buddhism is his characterization of nirvana as a nothingness and as a form of nihilism. However, this does not best describe the Buddhist path. There are four noble truths in Buddhism. The first one is the acknowledgement of dukkha, or suffering, an inseparable characteristic in the realm of samsara, which suggests that human beings at the time of death are reborn into a realm determined by their karma. It is a cycle of aimless drifting, wandering, or mundane existence. If we stop here, we can see why Nietzsche considers it nihilistic. However, this is but one of the noble truths. The second one is the origin of this suffering, which comes from craving, desire, or attachment. And the third one states that there is an end to suffering. By letting go of this craving, this leads to the final noble truth, which is the path that gives way to renouncement of craving and the cessation of suffering, following the noble eightfold path which liberates one from samsara, the painful cycle of rebirth, achieving nirvana, the cessation of all afflictions, actions, rebirths and suffering that are a consequence of afflictions and actions. Nirvana refers to the realization of the non-self and emptiness, marking the end of rebirth by stilling the fires that keep the process of rebirth going. This is what Nietzsche thought of as a longing for nothingness. However, it is not a longing for nothingness. It is simply the end of samsara, thus different from Schopenhauer's pessimism. Buddhism starts pessimistic, but ends with the positive experience of nirvana. It is not an escape from the world. One begins with the suffering inherent in life. One is to overcome pleasure and pain before beginning a mindful examination of one's self and reality as perceived by the self. Upon this examination, one realizes that there is no self, but only the combination of mental and physical states, skandhas. This realization of non-self is also misunderstood. It is not a destruction of a self, but rather a rejection of the existence of a self. Buddhists believe that the concept of emptiness means that all things are empty of inherent existence. There is no such thing as inherent existence. Everything arises mutually. Thus, negation in the East does not have the same pessimistic connotation that it has in the West. Perhaps the most serious misreading we find in Nietzsche's account of Buddhism was his inability to recognize that the Buddhist doctrine of emptiness was an initiatory stage leading to a reawakening. Throughout Nietzsche's books and notes, he refers to different aspects of Eastern philosophy on more than 400 occasions, and in several of these he claims to be interested in it. Although Nietzsche considers Eastern philosophy as nihilistic, he does indicate its profundity. It seems that he studied this material closely and appreciated it greatly. This is important to note. 
Although Nietzsche despises sacred texts, he upholds the beauty and grandeur of them as literary documents. Nietzsche's interest in studying Buddhism seems to be seeing it as a psychological symptom, as well as a historically embedded phenomenon. Having chosen Buddhism to comment on might be in line with his idea of having the courage to engage with worthy adversaries. In the Antichrist, he states, he, the Buddha, does not advocate any conflict with unbelievers. His teaching is antagonistic to nothing so much as to revenge, aversion, ressentiment. And in all this, he was right. For it is precisely these passions which, in view of his main purpose, are unhelpful. Here he agrees on the Buddha's doctrine, which is opposed to the feelings of revenge, antipathy, and ressentiment. And in Das Buch Zarathustra, he said, For that man be delivered from revenge, that is for me the bridge to the highest hope, and a rainbow after long storms. Nietzsche's conceptions of the eternal recurrence and samsara, Zarathustra and Bodhisattva, a person who is able to reach nirvana but delays doing so through compassion for suffering beings, the transvaluation of all values and nirvana are all examples of similarities. In his analysis of the self, Nietzsche contended the subject is only a fiction, the ego of which one speaks, when one censures egoism, does not exist at all. This is remarkably similar to the Buddhist doctrine of non-existence of the self. Nietzsche's philosophy may have been much more similar to Buddhism than he might have realized. This should not be surprising, given Nietzsche's respect for the Buddha, and that Buddhism concerns itself with one of the basic problems with which Nietzsche was grappling, the structure and meaning of the human condition. At the onset of his mental collapse, he even came to identify himself with Buddha. I have been Buddha in India, Dionysus in Greece. However, on the whole, this impression is deceptive. Both Hinduism and Buddhism are of interest to Nietzsche not in themselves, but as alternative positions from which to continue his attack on Christianity. He declared that the critic of Christianity is profoundly grateful to the students of India for making Buddhism available as a religion to compare with Christianity. In his day, there was considerable academic and popular interest in India and the religion of the majority of its inhabitants. In the twilight of the idols and the antichrist, Nietzsche uses the term Chandala, which he borrowed from the Indian caste system, where Chandala is a member of the lowest social class. He compared the caste system as an example of a breeding morality, as opposed to the Christian version of slave morality. To be clear, Nietzsche does not like either morality. However, he favors the Chandala morality in a relative sense to the morality of Judeo-Christianity. This interpretation relied on a translation of the laws of Manu, an ancient Sanskrit text which was a relatively well-known text in 19th century Europe. He read Louis Jacolliot's French translation. He was a major popularizer of Hinduism, although critics later called him an India fanatic, and that in his works romanticism often predominates over scientific truth, so that he must be considered as a very brilliant vulgarizer rather than a scholar. Nietzsche refers to Jacolliot by name in one of his notebooks, and sometimes gives page numbers with the extracts that he translates into German. No other Indian text excited Nietzsche in this way. This by itself is astonishing. But no less remarkable are his previous knowledge of Hinduism and India. Nietzsche wrote to Henrik Koselitz, who served as the editor of Nietzsche's writings and with whom he had a long-term friendship, about his discovery. I owe to these last weeks a very important lesson. I found Manu's Book of Laws in a French translation. This absolutely Aryan work, a priestly codex of morality based on the Vedas, on the idea of caste and very ancient tradition, supplements my views on religion in the most remarkable way. I confess to having the impression that everything else that we have by the way of moral law-giving seems to me an imitation and even a caricature of it. Even Plato seems to me in all main points simply to have been well instructed by Brahman. Schopenhauer, who quotes the Manu twice in his book, The World as Will and Representation, refers to it as the oldest of all the codes of law. His enthusiasm was widely shared. It may be assumed that Nietzsche felt a similar gratitude in respect of the availability of Hinduism, although he seldom referred to it, nor did he use the word Hinduism, speaking rather of Brahmanism, the Vedanta, or Indian philosophy in general. 
The only extensive Indian text he read was the Laws of Manu, and with much enthusiasm. It is one of the books he possessed in his extensive private library. However, Nietzsche disliked the ancient Sanskrit play Sekuntala, a work that took educated Europe by storm, and was praised by Goethe, the most famous literary figure in Europe, and who Nietzsche himself ranked among the greatest human beings that have ever lived. In Nietzsche's work of dramatic theory, The Birth of Tragedy, he does not even refer to this play. This might be a matter of personal taste, but also shows a mind close to India, since it was thought to be the oldest of all dramatic forms and was quite popular in the day. On the other hand, Nietzsche uses a Vedic hymn, the oldest Sanskrit texts, and the most venerated as a motto for his book Daybreak, the least studied of his works. There are many dawns which have yet to shed their light. In one of the book's passages he wrote, for those Brahmins believed, firstly, that the priests were more powerful than the gods, and secondly, that the power of priests resided in observances, which is why their poets never wearied of celebrating the observances, prayers, ceremonies, sacrifices, hymns, verses, as the real givers of all good things. Nietzsche takes this superiority of men over gods as a goal to be imitated. Let us first all see to it that Europe overtakes what was done several thousands of years ago in India, among the nation of thinkers, in accordance with the commandments of reason. However, Nietzsche's strongest connection with Hinduism in India comes from his friendship with Paul Doysom, the great European expert on the Vedanta, who was also a friend of Swami Vivekananda, a key figure in the introduction of Indian philosophy to the Western world. In a letter to Paul Doysom, Nietzsche writes, I have, as you know, a profound sympathy with everything that you have in mind to undertake, and it belongs to the most essential fostering of my freedom from my prejudice, my trans-European eye, that your existence and work remind me again and again of the one great parallel to our European philosophy. He did indeed possess a trans-European eye, often distancing himself from his contemporary situation in order to better understand the phenomenon of European modernity. And yet, there does appear in the unpublished notes from 1884 the following fascinating resolution. I must learn to think more orientally about philosophy and knowledge. Oriental overview of Europe. In Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals, he mentions the Upanishads or the Eternal Order, which are the Vedic Sanskrit texts that are still revered in Hinduism. And he also refers to the translated works of his friend Paul Doysen on the Brahma Sutras, which summarizes the philosophical and spiritual ideas in the Upanishads, the concepts of Brahman, ultimate reality, and Atman, soul or self, being the central ideas, the thematic focus being to know that you are the Atman. An important departure from Buddhism, where there is no permanent self or soul in living beings. The Veda states that one should liberate oneself from the illusion of individuality and recognize that one is the Atman. This is exactly the same thing that Nietzsche wants. The man in us is something to be overcome and strive for the figure of the Übermensch. Schopenhauer also gives a striking anticipation of Nietzsche's Übermensch by postulating a man who found satisfaction in life and took perfect delight in it, who desired, in spite of calm deliberation, that the course of his life as he had hitherto experienced it should be of endless duration or of constant recurrence, whose courage to face life was so great that in return for life's pleasures, he would willingly and gladly put up with all the hardships and miseries to which it is subject. Nonetheless, Schopenhauer preferred the man who understood the truth of the Upanishads. He knows that he himself is that will of which the whole world is the objectification or copy, to which therefore life and also the present always remain certain and sure. The present is the only real form of the will. Therefore, no endless past or future in which he will not exist can frighten him, for he regards these as an empty mirage and the web of Maya. Schopenhauer then declares that in the Bhagavad Gita, literally the Son of God, that Krishna puts his young pupil Arjuna in this position. However, Nietzsche ignores this. He ignores the Bhagavad Gita entirely, for he makes his own way. Schopenhauer makes an intriguing reference to Shiva in conjunction with Dionysus in the first volume of The World as Will and Representation. Birth and death belong equally to life. The wisest of all mythologies, the Indian, expresses this by giving to the very god who symbolizes destruction and death. 
to Shiva as an attribute not only the necklace of skulls but also the lingam, that symbol of generation, which appears to be the counterpart of death. It was precisely the same sentiment that prompted the Greeks and Romans to adorn the costly sarcophagi, just as we still see them, with feasts, dances, marriages, hunts, that is, with presentations of life's most powerful urge. Nietzsche's many references to dance in Dusburg's Zarathustra have often made subsequent readers think of dancing Shiva. There are several points of convergence between Shiva and Nietzsche, Dionysus Zarathustra. Shiva, the archetype of the Indian wandering ascetic, whose home is the Himalayas, Shiva is the yogi and a wild dancer, Shiva is a resemblance to Dionysus, and so on. In the end of daybreak, he states, Will it perhaps be said of us one day that we two, staring westward, hope to reach in India, but that it was our fate to be wrecked against infinity? Or, my brothers, or... However, it seems that the experience of Nietzsche's India could have been the other India for which he said at the end of daybreak, an India where no one lived but Nietzsche. Finally, I would like to leave you with a thought-provoking statement that Nietzsche made in 1876. I imagine future thinkers in whom European-American indefatigability is combined with a hundredfold inherited contemplativeness of the Asians. Such a combination will bring the riddle of the world to a solution.